quickly introduce myself. I'm Jigna Desai. I'm the head of Center for Heritage Conservation. Once again, thank you for joining us. Um, we are here to uh, start our work at Launch in a Way, our initiative that is that we've titled Bulanshire Heritage Conservation Initiative. This initiative is a collaboration between the Kala Chopal Trust and Center for Heritage Conservation at CEPT Research and Development Foundation. Uh, the Kala Chopal Trust was uh, founded in 2018 and it works in the area of arts, culture and environmental sustainability with a ground up approach. Amongst many programs that, uh, that are initiated by Kala Chopal uh, Trust is the Bulanshair Legacy Program. Uh, it is focused on a socio-cultural environmental documentation of the region of Bulanshair in Uttar Pradesh. Today we have Linita Jacob here with us, who is the managing trustee of Kala Chopal, and she will be talking about uh, the Bulanshair Legacy uh, Initiative. She's uh, also born and she was brought up in Bulanshair and is extremely passionate about conserving the heritage of the city and the region. Uh, Center for Heritage Conservation, who is the other partner of this initiative, focuses on advancing the discourses of uh, built heritage conservation through the lens of sustainability and equity in the Indian context. The team at CHC approaches conservation as a comprehensive process that is situated in an ever-changing environment. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the center currently is headed by me. The activities that we intend to do as a part of our Bulanshara Heritage Conservation Initiative are research and documentation, uh, educational activities, uh, advisory activities for, for a sustainable future of the heritage of the region. And we hope to also publish our findings uh, for a wider access. Uh, the first subject that we are picking up for our initiative is the, um, uh, the architecture that was done and was initiated by Frederick Grouse in Bulan uh, In 70s, Frederick Grouse was posted in uh, Mathura and subsequently was the district magistrate and collector of Bulanshahar between 1876 and 1884. Grouse was a unique in the way he addressed his relationship with the locals and used built environment to, protect, to project his alignments with, ide with ideology, thoughts and people. We believe that conservation of his works in context of the postmodern narratives of decolonization would bring an important historic perspective to the place and its people. It would also be a good case for shared heritage. Uh, this, in this webinar, we are going to, which is titled Understanding the Architectural Heritage of Colonial Bulanshair, we've got some fantastic speaker. Rinika will be talking about uh, her initiatives and her experience in Bulanshair. We have Dr. Venugopal Madapati, who is uh, from the School of Design in Ambedkar University. He has done so very deep research on Grouse's work, and he will be presenting his findings here today. We have Mr. Jonathan Kennedy from, uh, who's the director of uh, Director Arts British Council India, and Mr. Jatinder Verma, who is the founder of JV Productions. They, be, they will be talking about uh, the importance of shared heritage and their, their view, their very interesting views on shared heritage. Uh, we have uh, Ms. Shraddha Arora, who is uh, the co the who's kind of leading and coordinating this uh, initiative of uh, Bulanshahar Heritage Conservation Initiative on behalf of uh, both the organizations. Uh, she is a conservation architect and a historian, and she is just now leading a research by three students of in uh, three students from Masters in Conservation and Regeneration at Faculty of Architecture, SEPT University, and the th three researches are located in Bulanshahar. The research. The researchers have just started. It's just been three weeks. So uh, Shraddha will be talking about uh, possibly just the titles and the areas that the students are beginning to research on. And we hope that in future, we will have further collaborations to discuss this research um, in its depth. Uh, I'll end my screen here and uh, Linika, over to you, please. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jigna. Thank you for that introduction. Thank you, everybody, the speakers, the collaborators, and the listeners. Um, as um, Jigna was mentioning, that I run the Kala Chopal, and I am a citizen as well from the city. Um, for me, Bolenshir is uh, 
you know, for that reason, extremely close personally. And also it's a great way of uh, sort of presenting a pilot project uh, in a more manageable way because, you know, hometowns are where you know everybody and you can galvanize people and you can, you know, build uh, your, use your uh, childhood familiarities to sort of galvanize and uh, influence, uh, you know, um, other families and other people that have lived with these, uh, um, the past heritage. Bulencia today, you know, seems like this nondescript UP town. It's overrun with traffic, it's dusty, and it's got haphazard movements, but under all that sort of uh, movement, there is, you know, in under the new development, there's still uh, dredges of the old, uh, sort of characteristics of old history that exist and are disappearing really, really, really fast. Um, and that's the reason why we, uh, you know, uh, we are so excited about this uh, conservation heritage initiative. Um, there is very limited knowledge on the, on the structures. Everybody drives past these structures, but nobody has any narrations or histories around this. Um, uh, I think the only way to share this is to document and research and present in a sort of a cohesive way. Um, and uh, that's the reason why this heritage con. This is, you know, a, a typical image of old image of the of late 19th century. This area still exists, but it's overrun with development, new development, and you don't see it this way anymore. Um, next, please. Grouse was a person who looked beyond cities. He looked at past heritage. He, he was, you know, he excavated. Uh, he found the old, uh, you know, the Buddhist narratives in this area, um, uh, you know, but he, his entire narration was based on another Indian gentleman who, who came prior and gazetted, uh, who was, um, Satya, can you move to the next slide, please? Yeah, it was Raja Lachman. And, you know, he was the first guy who was given this sort of, uh, intimidating ta uh, task to do a statistical memoir of this district, Bulenshire, which was, uh, you know, it was flanked by Delhi. It was, the, you know, there were shared borders. And uh, he took this onerous task. And then, you know, Grouse came after him and actually picked up a lot of the information from him, uh, from his uh, memoir and, and his uh, book. Can you move uh, to the next one? So there are traces in Bulenshire of the old Naga kings. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Uh, there are traces of, uh, next slide please, Satvika, of Buddhism, you know, in this area and the Kushans and, uh, you know, Grouse eventually put the museum together and, you know, we know of course who will follow uh, with this conversation, um, talk about the Mathura museum where a lot of these Kushan and Buddhist influence sculptures are. Um, just go to the next one, please. So, you know, Valencia legacy, we sort of project is divided into multi-narratives of 1857 mutiny, the built history, a citizens forum, a people's legacy, the Ramsar wetlands, because, you know, we're also working on the biodiversity map of this area, the flora, fauna, archeology, span water history. So we are trying to do a complete documentation. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is the first launch uh, of, uh, you know, the first round of initiative, and we look forward to many more. You can go to the next slide, please. And I just want to sort of acknowledge all the institutions and all the individuals that have contributed uh, thus far. Uh, the Shivnada University and Jindal School of Art and Architecture and, you know, CHC. I'm very, very grateful for, you know, to everyone. And uh, today to Jonathan and, you know, Dr. Venugopal and uh, to Jatinder, to, you know, for ha having participated in this uh, sort of uh, conversation. Thank you. And uh, Jigna, over to you again. So I think we move over to uh, the presentation by Venu Gopal, who's going to talk about the uh, uh, architecture of Frederick Krauss and colonial Bulanshir. Over to you, Dr. Venu. Yeah, hi. Uh, hi, everybody. I'm really grateful to be to have this opportunity to speak about Bulanshir. And uh, I've actually been um, traveling to Bulanshir since the early 2000s. Um, this is as I was doing my coursework at the University of Minnesota. And um, I've had quite a, a variety of experiences. And um, I sort of uh, stopped going back 
I think starting from 2012, 13 onwards, because I got involved in other things and I was working on my book and my monograph. So I think it's only now after so many years that I'm returning. Although I have been following uh, Bulan Shair Ki Shairi. Uh, there's a uh, page on uh, Facebook, Bulan Shair and Poetry. And a lot of um, Urdu poets actually uh, keep featuring on that site. So I do keep in touch with that and uh, on and off. There's also a page on Gulauti, I think, and poetry over there. So that's been one way in which I've tried to sort of stay in touch. But uh, I think I'm, and then, and then talking today, I'm actually going to go into material which I was working on much earlier in time. Uh, and I do hope to return fairly soon and recommence work. So this presentation is about architecture and it's about Grouse's architecture, although I think it's important to uh, contextualize Grouse a little bit. And so it might, I, I'm going to do a little bit of this uh, context building. This presentation is called uh, An Emphasis on Emphasis. One second, let me move too far, yeah. It's called An Emphasis on Emphasis. And I think you'll understand that, for instance, this image that you're seeing of a gate uh, in Bulanshahar, uh, I don't think it's extent anymore. Uh, but this gate in some ways actually embodies this idea of an emphasis and emphasis. And I think, uh, and, and, and this is in the imagination of Frederick uh, Salmon Graves, whose image you're seeing over here, and perhaps by the end of this presentation, I hope to explain how that is the case, right? So, um, but before we get into Grubbs, I sort of had to uh, get into this question of this idea of emphasis. That's basically what we're trying to understand over here. And why Grubbs comes into the picture is because he's a critic of something that we call conventionally de-emphasizing, right? And, and that's what I want to talk about for a bit, right? So this, this history of de-emphasizing is something that comes up in, in the context of the emergence of a very big colonial institution in the 19th century, uh, in the 1850s, called the Public Works Department. So it's the British Public Works Department, which actually draws our attention to this question of emphasis and de-emphasis, although these words were probably not used at that time, and something uh, which we'd actually sometimes what, uh, what architectural historians call autonomization, right? So I'm gonna actually very briefly talk about this in the context of the British Public Works Department. So what you see is that with the emergence of the uh, British Public Works Department, Public Works Department in the 1850s, there is an increasing emphasis on autonomizing the craft of designing space from something which you call hierarchy, right? So at a very crude basic level, what we understand of autonomy is that autonomy is an autonomy from something, it's an autonomy from hierarchization, right? And so the British uh, sort of um, officialdom is very scared of this idea of hierarchy at, at one level, although they pursue hierarchy in a different register, but there's a very strong emphasis on getting away from hierarchization, especially in architecture, and you'll just see how. So when we actually imagine the idea of building, right? I mean, trying to understand a 19th century, let's say Victorian or pre-Victorian Georgian conception of building in the British colonial imagination, and also with the East India Company, we're usually thinking of buildings which have, um, which have what you call a unified or hierarchical organization of functions, right? What does that even mean? So we'll actually take a practical example to get, take a sense of it. Um, so essentially the overall appearance of the building or this unified notion of what a building should look like precedes the organization of functions, right? So in architectural terms, what you essentially, to give you an example, and this is what you'd actually call a very famous building from the Regency period in England. Uh, it's the Brighton Pavilion, and it's, you know, it's tied in with this particular British king, um, George IV, who's considered to be like this really, this big voluptuary who's very much uh, fascinated by, you know, uh, the idea of the East. And in his conception, there's always a very strong notion of hierarchy, right? So if you just take a look at this image, or you take a look at a few of the other images, if you actually take a look at this, um, the way in which this building is organized, what you do see is a central space which seems to be taller in comparison to the adjacent spaces, right? So essentially, there is a very strong sense of a center in this entire complex. There's something which actually towers over the rest of the things around it. And oftentimes, more often than not, such an idea of emphasis, of hierarchy in the articulation of spatial elements usually is tied in with our conceptions of monarchy or kingship or some kind of expression of power, 
right? That you dominate the environment around you. It's a very simple, I'm giving you a very simplistic almost analysis of architectural space. Um, but there's certainly uh, this idea of everything revolving around the center, which is usually the monarch, right? Which is usually the sovereign. So the expression of sovereignty in architecture is quite a dominant expression. And there is this big haunting memory in, in the, you know, in, in the British mind at that time of, of this period of excess, of this excess of sovereign authority, or certainly the excess of uh, uh, display of sovereign authority through forms of architecture, right? And so there's, a, there's this massive recoil that comes in this uh, post-Georgian period in, you know, in the history of England. Uh, which then also reaches India in different ways. There's also a recoiling against the excesses of the East India Company and its lavish sort of expenditures. So what you begin to see in the 1850s with the emergence of what you call a public works department, a British public works department, is an emphasis on austerity, right? And also an emphasis on de-emphasizing, which means to reduce the emphasis of this authoritarian notion of center, right? And that predominantly, so this is to just give you a sense of how this plays out in the plan, that you always have symmetrical organization in space in terms, when you think in terms of hierarchical organizations of spaces, this is the Brighton Pavilion itself. So you actually see a center which dominates, right? And everything is organized around it. So this is not like the way in which we imagine modern building, right? Modernism, for instance, is all about functions being organized. And then the form sometimes emerges. But in hierarchical organizations of spaces, what you see is a dominant form around which everything organizes itself. So, uh, so what you see with the emergence of the PWD is an increasing emphasis on uh, uh, establishing the plan itself as a neutral, the word neutral is very important, which is a non-hierarchical system of order, entirely abstracted from the personal experience of a perspectival observer. This is something I'll just mention in a second. Why this is important in the context of the lunch and grouse, you will see uh, in a short while. So, this idea of moving away from a, a moving towards a de-emphasis of this sort of central sovereign space, right, which looms and towers over everything else, towards what you call like these sort of peripheral spaces. This, in architectural terms, we refer to as something called the pavilionation or the removal of a center, right, a, a, a kind of a de-emphasizing, right. So this is something that you don't see here, for instance, in the case of the Brighton Pavilion. You do see an emphasis in the center. You do see that like other spaces perhaps would be organized around something which actually towers in the middle. Um, but what you see with the emergence of the PWD uh, is, is um, um, this autonomization from this notion of a center, right? So the center of the new buildings to use more contemporary language is no longer the heart of the whole. It is no more than a geometrical point to which all the parts relate. So the buildings are not, uh, so essentially what you see with these new plans, especially with the plans that are coming up with the PWD, is that there is no such thing as a center, right? And there is no unified notion of space. Every part has a, uh, has a life of its own. So if you actually take an example of some of these plans that are coming up with this massive infrastructural push in India, in the um, middle uh, portions of the uh, uh, 19th century on towards the end as well, you see that these spaces are not unified geometry, right? This is a plan of the building. The building is like, a, you could remove any part of this building and that will not affect the whole, right? Because it is not organized around the center, right? And you just start seeing a standardization of these kinds of spaces being created, right? So this is a kind of a de-emphasis on the center, a de-hierarchization of space, if you will, right? And this is the kind of architecture that sprouts up all over India, wherever the British Empire kind of is, is it's spreading itself in the latter part of the 19th century, be it courts and kacheris, be it... Uh, be it barracks, um, you know, be it uh, any kind of office building, utilitarian architecture, you start seeing this kind of a de-emphasized, de-hierarchized uh, uh, form of building that's coming up. And with very standardized plans, the same plans are being implemented in a variety of settings in colonial Vijaywada or in, in, in colonial Bulandshahar, you might see something similar being executed, right? The same standard plans are being circulated all over the country to various locations in the empire. So essentially, um, and this is something that you actually have come up in scholarship, actually, um, where there's a particular scholar, Peter Scriver, who actually historicizes this entire emergence of this, you know, this emphasis on standardization and de-emphasizing, so to say, right? And that's something which actually becomes a beginning point for us to understand what we are actually going to see happen in Bulanshire, because until we begin to understand what's happening with 
the public works department, it would not be possible, it will not be possible to really comprehend uh, Grouse's interventions in Bulanshir and, kind, and the kinds of architectural efforts that he actually you see uh, being undertaken by him with the help of public subscription. Um, so again, um, this is the time I'm just sort of going to quickly get into Grouse now. Um, now, as you have been informed, uh, Grouse is this sort of district collector who serves in Mathura. And he's clearly having a lot of problems with the public works department, right? He's constantly fighting and constantly bickering. There's this extensive record of Grouse's utterances on what he identifies as the excesses of the public works department, right? And his, co his commentaries are directly leveled at the kinds of buildings that are being made by the public works department, right? And so to give you an example, this is a, a reproduction of a reproduction by Grouse uh, of uh, uh, an elevation of a building that's actually the law courts in Bulanshire. They do exist today. Um, and this is uh, roughly what it looks like. And what let's just see what Grouse has to say about this elevation, right? So this is from his book. Uh, this is what he says. So the most important government building in the Bulanshire district is the set of law courts and revenue offices at headquarters. The facade, which is of this particular building, which is 170 feet in length may be adequately descri described as a long low wall pierced with a uniform row of round headed cavities. There is no porch nor any other feature by which to distinguish the front from the back, right? So if you take a look at this, he's saying there's no porch in this building and there's no distinguishing feature which, set this, you know, which uh, helps us to identify the front of this building from the back. Uh, uh, so uh, nor on either side is any one doorway marked off from its fellows as a main entrance. So again, what you're seeing is de-emphasis over here. You're not seeing any one single doorway over here, which seems to stand out, right? In any hierarchical notion of the organization of space. Everything over here seems to be just about similar to everything else, right? So he's saying that this is something that, you know, this is what he's commenting on, right? Um, um, nor on either side of any one doorway marked off from its fellows as a main entrance. The design would answer equally well or indeed much better for a dry goods store, a barrack or a factory. So no stranger unfamiliar with the economic eccentricities of Anglo-Indian administration could for a moment suppose that a building of such a mean and poverty stricken appearance represented a million people and was the, was the fiscal center of a district contributing over 14 lakhs of rupees to the annual revenue of the state. So this is what he's basically saying. He's saying that essentially, this building can serve as just about anything, right? Because there is no hierarchy here, because there is no way of distinguishing this part of the building from that part of the building, because there is no way of distinguish distinguishing, distinguishing the front of this building from the back of the building, it could just as well serve as a go down. It could just as well serve as a store, right? So he's saying that this is the nature of the work that the public works department is doing, right? Because they want to be austere, because they want to get away from this idea of hierarchy, this is the kind of architecture that they're producing. And Grouse clearly has an issue with this, right? But from one perspective, and just to give you a sense of what, the, what this particular structure looks like today, it's being actually restored. You know, these are the images of the building. They exist currently. Uh, this is actually, I just received these images from the Kala Chopal Trust. And what you'll find is this building is being conserved. And I think that's very important because I think on the one hand, it's an important record of this emphasis of, of this emphasis on de-emphasizing, right? Which is to move away from hierarchy, right? And so that is an important move because it does point towards some kind of social uh, kind of progressiveness on the part of the public works department because it's trying to get away from hierarchical thinking. But at the same time, it's also problematic from Grouse's perspective because he says that this in itself is in creating a new hierarchy. Because everybody who's powerful in the town of Bulanshire is beginning to emulate this kind of architecture and is therefore re-establishing a new hierarchy of power, right? Even as it's itself trying to get away from hierarchical modes of thinking. So that's the kind of paradox that we have with, when we're trying to imagine conserving and preserving colonial heritage, right? Uh, on the one hand, it's clearly always a symbol of power, right? It's always something that's reminding us of us, of, I don't want to say any us because it's another time we're looking at, you shouldn't get into these kinds of continuities in time. But I'd say if you're talking about a colonized or a subject people, it always points towards a difference in terms of power. But at the same time, that's still not a complete enough picture because it's not telling us exactly how it came about, 
that in its own conception, this kind of a space was at the same time trying to de-hierarchize, at least in its own context, specifically in the British courts. So that's why this kind of a complex legacy is something to not just dismiss, but rather to actually accept as a part of a composite history that we have, that uh, we can't simply wish away any part of history just because it doesn't suit our particular present day narratives. So I think that's something that we can see, but now let's just talk about how Grouse is actually approaching this. So you can see it's being conserved, and I think it's a very good thing that it's being conserved um, because it is important for us to embrace this complex complexity that comes into the past of the societies that we live in. But Krauss, for instance, as he's opposing all of this, he's got a wholly different approach. He says, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think I want, to con I don't want to contribute to this de-emphasis, right? And what does he do? Well, I mean, if you actually take a look at some of the books that he produces, including this one, which is actually quite an extraordinary text, which I think, and with the kinds of images that you have within it, is, well, he says, I'm going to actually emphasize emphasis, right? So you have this kind of return of emphasis with graphs. And that's what Bulansher and Mathura, these are very special spaces from the perspective of, if you, if you come at it from the specific perspective of the Public Works Department, because Grouse is doing exactly what the Public Works Department is not doing. And he's very conspicuously doing it. To give you an example, now this is precisely why this image embodies an emphasis and emphasis. Why? Well, it's emphasizing an entrance, right? It's actually trying to show you that there is a hierarchy and that this central portion somehow has to stand out from what's adjacent to it, right? It's a very simplistic analysis, but this is the description that he provides in his book. So this is actually the boundary wall running parallel to the North Veranda, the town hall in Bulanshire, and it's broken at the center by a little gate. So he's just emphasizing brokenness, right? That I actually have to break this tedium of this horizontality, right? And it's in also, it just so happens that it's immediately opposite the carriage drive le leading up to the collector's house, which should also tell you how Grouse also sees himself because he's the collector. He sees himself as being at the center, right? So he's also trying to establish his power. So he's not innocent in any way of power. He's very much a wielder of power. And I think that's something that you see repeatedly in his writing. And again, if you look at the majority of the projects that Grouse is actually attempting, he's always trying to get back to this articulation of emphasis. A lot of emphasis on gateways, for instance, right? So if you notice this particular entrance to a gate, which is the cover of his book, uh, uh, which comes out in 1885, uh, it's called the Chapravat Gate, and it's actually emphasis. It's actually trying to set apart the entrance from what is immediately adjacent to it, right? And this obsession with gates that you see in Grouse's patronage, and it's throughout Bulanshahar, even in Kurja, right? I haven't been able to see the Anup Shahar archive, but I'm presuming that he's done work there as well. So there's very strong emphasis, and, he's, and it's not just that the fact that he's actually emphasizing, he's then going on to write in his text about this, to emphasize it even further. So this is another image of the particular structure that you're looking at. And you'll find parallels of these kinds of structures in Mathura, right? Which perhaps indicates that either he was seeing this happen in Mathura or he was himself patronizing this kind of material. So this is actually what the Chapravat gate looks like in the present, right? This again, I received from the, um, the Kala Chopal Trust. And I think it's, it's obviously it by itself, it's kind of being de-emphasized by itself because I think the surrounding uh, material is actually beginning to wear off a little. But it should give you a sense of you know, how this is not isolated. This is a response to the politics of the PWD, right? And mind you, the PWD is constantly doing de-emphasizing because it's being run by military engineers, right? And so there's a huge conflict inside the PWD itself between the military engineers and the civil engineers. And now with somebody like Grouse coming in, the civilian district collector, right? So essentially, the seeing this kind of contest that actually is playing out in Bulanshe, right? And Grouse is actually constantly fighting against it. So, so now I think you might be in a better position to understand this question of emphasis. And I'm just going to restrict myself to talking about whatever within his patronage actually points towards his attempts at bringing together emphasis. Again, another gate, right? This is the Colvin gate. So I'm actually just going to read out the portions of the text that is appended to these uh, entrance, uh, um, these gate structures to give you a sense in which how Grouse is actually imagining these spaces, right? So this is actually just a piece of text which actually accompanies the image uh, in his uh, uh, memoir, right? So this gate forms the entrance to the municipal garden and town hall from the east or city side and was erected by local sub subscription in memory of Mr. Elliot Colvin, right? For some years, commissioner of the mayor of division, which belong, uh, includes the Bulanshire district. 
he was almost the only uh, official in my own service who has ever taken any practical interest in my pursuits and his sudden death was a great uh, blow to me as to his many other friends both english and indian the gate is a graceful and picturesque composition and the very last days that i spent in bulandshahar i was busy employed in hurrying it on to completion the following inscription is engraved on a panel on one side of the main arch looking towards the garden so again he's not just going to again even simply leave this uh, this creation in the scolven gate by itself even within this he's actually got to emphasize something right so now it's not entirely clear where this inscription was because i think by going by him it should be somewhere behind this particular uh, corbel or the, you know that you see this projection over here but again my point is that he's even using text to actually draw emphasis on to this kind of you know hierarchical placement of space, you know, organization of space and it's it's something that you see repeatedly occur in his writing and his imagination and i think when i when i was studying bulandshahar in 2004 you know i was actually literally traveling around town looking at houses and constantly being reminded that i think this also has a lasting legacy in the, in terms of the kinds of houses that were coming up at that time that you actually do see remnants of this emphasis on emphasis you know in in other ways that it actually gets picked up but here's another gate that he does and the, just take a look at the description of this gate right this is the market gate at bulandshahar front view and again uh, if you take a look at the broader description in this i just highlighted a portion so the design is simple the proportions are massive and harmonious and again you notice the skyline is agreeably broken and use the word broken again over here by the head of the staircase and the general effect is distinctly architectural it is so placed that it forms a conspicuous object from many different points of view so notice when i mentioned initially in this presentation that what you see with somebody like uh, you know when you actually looking at the pwd they are actually trying to remove the observer from the picture altogether right because an observer in any context means the emergence of hierarchies right because an observer is immediately going to hierarchize space based purely on their visual perceptive uh, you know ability right so what grouse is again trying to bring in is an observer right so this bulandshahar if you in that sense try and understand grouse's legacy is a town which is built around the observer right and that's what's so special about bulandshahar right? it's one of the rare instances which is a town where you actually have a strong emphasis on the observer and that's one reason why it has to be conserved because you don't have too many such recorded instances of observer based towns or observer based urbanism if you will and apart from that again here's another entrance uh, and once again take a look at the description right i'm just going to bring up the emphasis the the feathery foliage of the babul trees also serves to break again please you uh, notice the use of the word break to break the long straight line between the two cupolas it may be as well to repeat here that for the thorough completion of the design a pavilion ought to surmount the central arch notice again more emphasis right as if this much emphasis was not enough and so but then again this would have entailed a further cost of rupees 2000 and funds were not available so again there is also an emphasis on funding and i won't get into that but just to point out that what he's saying is that he actually wants this street to turn up in the middle because he believes that even spending this much time to just get there from here to there is monotonous right so my point is that there's a very strong idea of on emphasis and that's why i'm saying the emphasis on emphasis and the final image that i want to work with is a a, a marketplace in khurja um again uh, i'm not sure if it is extent but i think it's worth exploring what you do see again here is and again you look at the description um, all the shops in the quadrangle present a uniform appearance with a front frontage of one broad central arch and a lower one on either side they vary however considerably in capacity some being quite shallow and others extending a long way back and this last point over the central arch of each shop is inscribed in nagari characters between the brackets under the eaves the name of the merchant who built it right so on the one hand he's saying look there's this space there's this market space where each of these shops seems very similar to the other because it's just the same central arch with these two flanking small arches these are cusped arches again in the mughal style uh, but they all look similar but actually inside it there's considerable vary uh, variation in terms of depth right and as if to accentuate that he actually has inscriptions over here each one indicating who the shop belongs to so essentially what you're looking at is a world where grouse's world where it's not just uh, what space but rather who space right so this question of the who is very central to understand grouse's conception of bulandshahar 
which unfortunately also then points towards hierarchization again, that you actually begin to see some kind of a hierarchy in terms of like, you know, a, a, a quote unquote, a native gentry that's actually working with the collector sahab, you know, and you again start seeing a re-hierarchization emerge, right, within the community that he's actually serving. So, of course, Grouse's own biases come into play. He's not at all by any stretch of imagination free of bias. I think that's something which you very quickly witness once you start reading it, and one has to be critical of him. But at the same time, I'm just saying that it's at, the, at its core, right, the emergence of this kind of architecture carries within it at least the desire to fight against the inequality of the PWD, that the PWD is producing with its kind of standardized plans and promoting that as the way to be. Right, but it's another thing that Grouse himself then becomes, you know, open and sort of uh, encourages new forms of inequality that actually come about in his patronage in Bulanshed. And I think that perhaps at some point in time you'll get a chance to read my paper, paper which is forthcoming. So I'll I'll stop just at that, um, and I'll just say that like uh, um, it was a pleasure speaking, and I hope uh, this might be of some benefit uh, to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Madhupati. I think uh, this entire idea of emphasis when you're talking about buildings, but and, and if you also look at the elements that are like gates, it's also emphasizing the urban relationships. And I yes. think it's quite uh, quite interesting to watch, uh, just to kind of look at it from that point of view, from the point of view of emphasizing not just buildings, but for also urban landmarks and urban situations that are important. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Madhapati. Uh, if anybody who has any questions, please put them in the YouTube chat. As I said, that uh, we will, Satvika will read them out for us here. Uh, over to you, Jonathan. Thank you very much for joining us. And uh, over to you. Uh, Thanks very much, Jigna and Lineker, for convening such a fascinating conversation this, this evening. And to Dr. Madhapali for an amazing presentation on, on something that makes tangible our shared heritage uh, through the architecture and the complicated and contested and challenging history, but nevertheless, one that is also real and meaningful. And I think how you just expressed some of those uh, changes and adaptations that came and um, how Rouse himself responded to India's architecture was really fascinating. So thank you very much for that. Uh, I'll talk a little around our work at British Council in the heritage sphere at the moment. Um, and then we'll, we'll move to an example of something that is contemporary in the UK, care of, care of my former colleague Jitinda Verma in the UK on project that he led um, whilst we were both at our former incarnations at Tara Arts. Um, but to talk a little around British Council's work, which is around mutuality and building connections and enterprise and creative expression. And that's around strengthening those bonds between in India and the UK most particularly at the moment around the creative economy. And that's born of several ways of working that we, that we have. One is around research, and we've done extensive research around the museums and heritage sector over the past few years in India, and it's published on our uh, compendium of research documents. Uh, and more recently, in the past couple of years, we've also been researching the impact of COVID-19 on the creative economy and different sectors in, in India, most especially around crafts, of course, an important part of the intangible heritage of, of India, and around different sectors in the past couple of years as well, specifically around livelihoods and art sectors across the economy in theatre, publishing, literature, heritage, uh, advertising, AR, to really get an understanding of what's been the impact of the pandemic on the sector and on livelihoods. And our third edition of that piece of research, Taking the Temperature, will be released later this year. Um, just last year, we, we had been working very closely with the Ministry of Tourism in West Bengal on the Durga Puja Festival, 
which brings together crafts and heritage, mythology, enterprise, uh, tourism, hoteliers. And that was looking at really the range of impact of that festival across Calcutta and the state in West Bengal and working closely with the Ministry of Tourism and Queen Mary's University in, in London and IIT in Calcutta and SmartCube, that research mapped the value of all of those aspects around the festival um, during its, its annual 10 days, 10 to five days in, in Calcutta and revealed some really fascinating uh, results in terms of the economic impact to GDP in the state. There's something like 2.5% every year. It's a major driver of the creative economy. And that also taps into, we know, real interest of the Central Ministry of Culture and Heritage and Museums and how they drive regeneration. So all the conversations around um, architecture, livelihoods, craft skills, intangible heritage, I think, taps into some of the conversations that we are now alive and extremely important to our conversations around the shared heritage between India and the UK. Something specific and most importantly, I think, around Durga Puja was that our research was part of a wider, a wider discourse and a wider drive from the Ministry of Tourism and the, and the Central um, uh, central ministry in West Bengal around the recent accreditation, or accreditation, not quite the right word, um, inscription of Durga Puja by UNESCO as part of the intangible heritage of the state and of the city. Uh, and that was really fabulous to see uh, securing the inscription before Christmas. Our current work around enterprise and connections and expression in heritage in particular, and our shared heritage, is with partnerships across Manchester, Glasgow, and at the moment in Bangalore. And that's really centered on institutional relationships between Manchester Museums and Glasgow Live and the Indian music experience and the Museum of Art and Photography in Bangalore. And that's about empowering young people, young people from in, in Bangalore and young people in Glasgow and Manchester to explore the heritage and develop heritage skills around conservation and curation um, that comes from those organizations working together and how we're convening that conversation around the shared heritage through the lens of young people. So it's also really starting to democratize how we understand heritage um, and looking at it from a very particular perspective of young people, as opposed to perhaps the more formal institutional relationships or more formally how perhaps heritage is interpreted from the UK side. Um, so that's some of our current work and that will um, be coming on track a lot more visibly over these next few months and, and in this year. And of course, it's a very significant year as it's in the 75th anniversary of independence this year and, and, and in August. And we will be marking that at British Council with the government of India as part of a program that is being developed at the moment called India UK Together. That's a key part of that sense of mutuality now as we look to the contemporary whilst absolutely acknowledging the past and you know, all its complexities around the heritage there. Um, but I think I'll stop there and move now to Jitin because I think a very modern interpretation of a challenge of theatre, a challenge of uh, uh, India and UK, and how both are really fundamental to the project that we worked on in my previous life at Tara Arts with Jatinda. So I'll pass on to Jatinda now to talk about that. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, and thank you to everyone uh, for what is proving to be uh, a, a, a fascinating, fascinating uh, uh, evening or afternoon, as in my case. Um, I, I want to kind of uh, start off before uh, talking specifically about uh, this uh, building that uh, was created 
Um, uh, so yeah, okay. Basically, it's a dialogue between East and West, all right, or West and East. But there's kind of two things to I'd like to say beforehand. One is that I, I have come to realize, and, and perhaps it's just a kind of trite realization, that buildings are living entities. Um, they have a life. They have a a feel. Um, and so rather like life itself, they are born and they may well die. Um, and that's kind of, uh, so anyway, let's just park that idea, but just this idea that buildings are living entities. The second point, and that's specifically perhaps related to the status of be being an immigrant uh, in the UK today, that one of the sort of defining um, dialogues or the dynamic of life is between erasure on the one hand and presence on the other. Um, by erasure, uh, yes, it's a little bit like looking at this particular kind of slide. This is where our theater was located. Now, this is a sort of photograph uh, just before industrialization started in this part of Southwest London. Um, and industrialization really begins to accelerate around the 1880s. So before then, uh, we see these, what are in effect, farms and kind of wide open vistas. And if we go to the next slide, here suddenly, I mean, this is a, photo that was taken in 1910 of a railway station, <clears throat> which is just near uh, or next to where Tower Theatre was located. This was built uh, in 1884 at the station itself. And very quickly after that, the buildings that you see alongside on either side began to rise. So by 1910, it takes on the kind of feature that you can still see today. If you look at the building on the left, it's kind of hodgepodge really. Uh, it's a sort of workshop. There is a, an entrance way uh, <clears throat> to quote what uh, Dr. Venugopal was saying. Um, I, I, and clearly this is an entrance way into the station itself. On the opposite side, you can see uh, awnings which have been pulled out, uh, possibly against rain, certainly to provide some degree of shade. And, that building on the right hand side is actually the forerunner of what uh, we now know as Tara Theatre. This area behind this building uh, is a massive graveyard or cemetery. And one of the fascinating things about that cemetery is uh, to see how many people are in there or how many graves there are of people who, uh, for want of a better term, can be called old India hands. In other words, they had service in India, uh, they came back and then you know, they died in this area. But what is lacking in that area is any real kind of sense of how empire is actually contributing to make this area what it is. And that takes us to the kind of project uh, that uh, we uh, initiated uh, to turn this building on the right hand side into a building which actually talks um, uh, or manifests uh, a dialogue between uh, Britain and India, uh, specifically, uh, if not kind of generally the West and East. Uh, and here one can just see the, the beginnings of a kind of concept uh, uh, model. Uh, the key thing to remember is that the frontage is part of a kind of high street. And the high street is a mix of residential buildings, which are usually on the upper floors, and retail buildings. Um, and of course, there's a great regulation about this particular area, uh, in part uh, dictated by the needs of transport. There is a wide road. There used to be trams which were running down that road. 
Uh, now there are, of course, uh, lorries and cars. So there is a limit to what you can do in terms of encroaching on uh, into, the, uh, into the thoroughfare itself. Um, so if we go on to the next slide, um, this is just to give you some kind of quick ideas of what we were trying to do within the footprint of the building itself. Uh, and let's just sort of quickly move through these slides. Now, so this was the kind of design eventually that came up with. And the things that we were interested in is precisely this dialogue between erasure and presence. On the one hand, so, sorry, just go back to the previous one. On the one hand, if one looks at the, uh, the front edge, the front edge is a sort of, is actually trying to preserve uh, the late 19th century uh, style of the building. Uh, very Edwardian style. You can see the, the way in which also the windows on the upper floors are laid out and it sits in sympathy with the rest of the block. Uh, the front door also, the archway is very much uh, the, the old kind of Edwardian door. So part of our intent was that we want to preserve that. That must not uh, be it would be a simple enough matter to destroy all of that and build this kind of new 21st century tube inside it. But we decided to go against that. The second thing was that we wanted to give a sense of a relationship with the uh, environment around us. So if you look on the left, there, there's the sort of sketch of the trees in some way, and these are the trees of the embankment. We wanted to echo those trees onto our building itself. And that led to eventually this design of a, of a tree, uh, you know, a stylized tree with branches on the frontage of the cube that was inserted behind the existing facade. Uh, and that's the way in which we wanted to get a sense of, a, of another type of dialogue, which was between the present that we are inhabiting and the past that the building was also a part of. Uh, now, of course, within that codification uh, was also the sense, and certainly that was very clear for me, uh, what for me became important about the tree was this notion that, I mean, if I think of the Upanishads and indeed of all form of uh, storytelling, it all starts from telling stories under the shade of a tree. And this was a theater, or this is going to be a theater. And so for me, it was very important that we also have this notion of the, of the, of the tree embedded at the, uh, at the front of the building itself. So if we just move on then, uh, this just gives you a kind of uh, sectional plan uh, of the various floors and how we wanted to kind of move about. And part of the sense was that to be able to from the from the road outside to get a sense that there is a theater inside. So it's almost on the same level all the way through. Uh, let's just go on. I, I mean, these couple of slides was just, again, now here, here we have a, a team of constructors who had no relationship to, to India, but who clearly uh, were involved in this particular kind of project. So we thought, well, okay, fine. Rather like uh, uh, you know one what might do in India, let's break a coconut. And so here we have a drill going right through the coconut to set up the first of our uh, breaking of the of the ground uh, to start the building. There now one begins to see the tree in relief and the way in which already in the sunlight uh, the branches on the embankment are casting shadows uh, on the building itself. And then we get to, yeah, well, that's another one of the, of the way that the branches are. Uh, now this detail, so this is the stucco work. Originally part of our thinking was to uh, work with the idea of, um, of mud, uh, the, the earth on which the embankment is built right next to this building, somehow to reflect that earth. Obviously it was very, very difficult uh, on a practical basis to create a building in London uh, of earth. So one began to look at this sort of rendered work, um, that the sort of stucco design, uh, that was also part of 
of course, very much the, 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 the English approach to architecture. And one can see the way in which the tree is reflected then into the interior uh, design within the building itself. Uh, let's move on, and that just gives you another one of the thing. Here now. So this is the front door. So we've got the Edwardian arch, but inset into the front door uh, is this door panel. Uh, a lot of all the doors throughout this building were sourced from India. So this one is from Kerala. And again, part of the idea was to start the conversation at street level between erasure and presence. And so within this uh, Edwardian door, you have this panel uh, from Kerala. Whether people know it's from Kerala or not is not the point. The point is they see something which is, uh, to use the word which is often uh, overused, uh, exotic, is different, is theatrical. On we go. Uh, the, so we can just sort of quickly run through. I don't want to kind of uh, spend too much time. So this is the out, outer garden and you can see the the embankment uh, flanking in there. And those walls are made of actual sleepers, railway sleepers. So again, part of the thing was that to find ways in which we have a relationship with our environment. Uh, this is the foyer area where people would gather before they then enter through these main doors into the theater itself. Uh, uh, move on, please. Uh, there's our mayor who was opening the Get this sort of official opening. And then if we go one further, there we have it. Now, there are two things about this. One is the floor. The floor is an earth floor. And again, this was part of my sense that just like buildings are constantly talking between the past and the present, Theta is constantly a conversation between the past and the present. And all theta starts on an earth floor uh, in an open space. We can't do an open space, but we've got a sense of the tree. Um, so the question became, you know, how do you get this earth? Uh, and so this earth, so again, I, I, you know, I, there's, I have no doubt in, in, in our heads, uh, and it was in the heads of uh, Claudia Mayer, uh, our designer, uh, and myself, um, we were clearly inspired by the, the, the earth floors, the mud floors that are used in various performing arts uh, in India, and also with the, with, for the wrestlers in the Akharas. Um, now, we couldn't quite get a kind of gober floor, uh, but what we then found was that there is a tradition in Western England of creating earth floors and earth walls using a mixture of uh, of the earth in Devon, which is the county from which it comes, and straw, as you can see within their straw and corn. Uh, and so then that's all mixed together. And then that's laid down on the floor. And in order to kind of uh, ensure that there is no dust, it's then lined with natural linseed oil and turpentine. And that's it, it preserves it. Um, there's natural light coming into the space uh, and again, that's the way in which we coordinate that was to have these wooden shutters, uh, which were very easily manipulated by being pulled by the rope that you see hanging from there. Uh, and basically you can sort of cut off the light uh, or leave it open as you see fit. So we can just sort of skip through. There's our wonderful mechanism for opening and closing the doors. And very important that there's a relationship between the upper floor, which is where the rehearsal studios are, and the ground floor, which is the, the theater itself. Uh, all the bricks that you see, sorry, uh, just on that, these are all the bricks of the original building. So even in the, uh, the bricks itself, we are getting this sort of sense of a, 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 a conversation going on between the past and the present. And of course the fittings in there, so the lighting fittings and so forth, those are fantastically modern. I mean, they are the latest lights uh, that were available at the time. Uh, so yes, we can now go on through. So there's the kind of door into the rehearsal room. Uh, and if you look at the other side of it, 
uh, there's the next slide. Uh, you know, they're kind of very clean. The spaces are very clean and that was deliberate. You don't want to over decorate the spaces. Uh, the doors will do it. And every time someone opens a door, their touch will hit the door and therefore a memory will be encased in the building itself, let alone the kinds of conversations that will come about by people new to the building coming in and trying to open these doors to get into the various spaces. This is the door into the basement uh, changing rooms. This gives you an idea of the changing rooms with all the fixtures above. Uh, so let, we took this idea for dialogue even into the toilets. One of the things that in any building, everyone uses. So when you open the door, the reverse is straight out of truck art. Uh, and again, this was something that we had painted, uh, so hand painted by our designers. Uh, so, so that there is a surprise constantly. Uh, and, and, and I just sort of put that uh, up there because this was something that uh, at the opening of the building, uh, we'd commissioned an opera singer, um, a, a composer to compose this and for a singer to then sing these words, uh, which we thought were fantastically appropriate. Uh, and perhaps even more so now uh, in the UK, uh, not to be confined by narrow domestic walls. Uh, so that ends this particular rather rushed uh, presentation. Uh, but as I said, the main point really, well, these two things to keep in mind. One, that buildings are living things. Um, and just to finish off that particular point, um, when the building was built in 1896, it was built to provide a meeting space for the workers who had built the railway. So uh, uh, rather, than, rather than them getting drunk, they could come into that building, uh, sing songs, uh, play music, so forth. Um, over time, uh, the garden area, which we uh, built um, the, so next to the building, became a public toilet. Uh, then over time, that building became a church. Um, and, and then the, the, the public toilet became a place where you uh, could buy milk um, and uh, pies uh, to you know, like take away joints. Uh, and then just before uh, we took over that particular building, it became a church uh, uh, by, uh, of immigrants, of immigrants from the Caribbean. So it's, the building sort of evolved over time. It had a life over the course of its time. And now it is this particular theater. I have no idea what it might become in 100 years time, 50 years time. But I hope that that uh, sense of its um, embedded within the architecture of this um, chat across spaces and across time uh, remains in some way, and for then people to make up their own um, views about how, uh, what, uh, what sense that makes in their own lives. Thank you all. Hopefully that Thank was you. Thank you very you much, uh, Jitinder, for that fantastic, very interesting presentation. I think it also emphasized the idea of uh, shared identities as, as something fluid in time and space, and not as something very rigid and uh, defined as we would like to believe. So thank you very much for that presentation. Um, uh, over to you, Shraddha, to speak about the work that the students of uh, the Masters in Conservation and Regeneration have just started. And then we will uh, take questions from, um, if, if anybody is asked questions on the live YouTube streaming. Over to you, Shraddha. Shraddha, we can't hear you. You're possibly on mute.
Shatak, we, uh, we can't hear you, Shatak. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, taking forward uh, from uh, chair. So uh, we had said, uh, uh, can, am I audible? Yeah. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, now you are. Am I audible now? Yes, sir, that we can hear you. It's a little broken, but we can hear you. Uh, am I audible? Okay, thank you. Uh, Okay, so uh, we at uh, CEPT uh, uh, master's course, uh, there is a director research project. Satvika, if you could move on. So it is basically a director research uh, project is an academic end of their postgraduate study at the Faculty of Architecture, Step University. And within the set, uh, set of themes which are given to, uh, in that particular year, students develop and execute an in inquiry and collate their research, their findings through a written dissertation or some other specific Uh, so under this directed research project this year for the master's students in architecture in conservation Shada, Shada, you're not generation. Shada, hello we had taken up the theme hello 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 Uh, Shraddha, your internet connection seems to be weak and we are not able to hear you very clearly. Do you mind if I go ahead with uh, talking about the slides and then we can, uh, you can participate in the discussion? You'll have to write in the chat. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'll just, um, I think Shraddha has spoken about the directed research project. And it's an, as she mentioned, it's an academic project undertaken by students towards the end of the postgraduate study in Faculty of Architecture. Uh, the set of students uh, here are uh, all three students from Masters in Conservation and Regeneration. There is uh, Rohan, uh, Pragya, and uh, uh, I'm forgetting the name of the third uh, student. Uh, Shraddha, if you can um, remind me of her name. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Next slide has a, a yeah. So the aim of uh, the first, yeah, Parul. So the first uh, research is uh, by Parul of all three of them are from Delhi. So their proximity to Bulan Sher is good. Uh, Parul is working on listing and mapping of historic towns, case of Bulan Sher. And here she's going to list, and as the title says, uh, she's going to uh, understand the process of listing and mapping and then apply it to the uh, to this uh, to the town of Bulanshire, and by the end of it, we may have a good documentation and understanding about the heritage uh, of Bulanshire. The second pro project is the materiality and making of F. S. Krause's buildings, and this is by Pragya. Uh, Pragya is going to look at the architectural ideology of F. S. Krause and the transition of construction methodology and materiality as observed in 19th century Bulanshire and how uh, this the, the discussion of shared heritage that we are having at the moment, how it panned out in case of uh, Bulan Sher. Uh, next, Satika. And we have Rohan's uh, work that talks about uh, establishing Bulan Sher as a historic urban landscape. Uh, for most of you who are conservation students would know what a historic urban landscape uh, is a kind of a, a terminology that is it's an approach that is identified by 
uh, UNESCO and that looks at the uh, uh, historic uh, city uh, in context of its environment and as an urban landscape rather than uh, like rather than a precinct or rather than an object. So I think that's what Rohan will be working on. Uh, next slide. Yeah, I think that's it. So this is the introduction of the three uh, uh, research that is that have just started, as I said it uh, in the beginning, that they are in the third week of uh, of uh, working on this area and possibly some some time in April. We, they will be ready with us to present the work that they have done to all of us. And uh, I think the inputs that they've got today from, uh, of course, the immense experience of Lenika and Lenika is always available as a resource person, but also uh, from uh, Dr. Madhapati, who already has a great uh, depth of understanding of Grouse buildings, Grouse's architecture. Uh, and I think the view of shared heritage uh, that uh, Jonathan and Jatinder just presented uh, and the fluidity of it and the contextuality of it would, would be important lessons for the students. Uh, I think we could look at questions if there are any or if any of you, anybody in this group as well wants to um, ask any, make any comments, ask any questions, I think that would be fantastic. Mm. So um, actually, I have a question for Venu. Um, yeah. So Venu, I didn't know that there was, uh, you know, grouse buildings outside of the central portion of the city. I didn't know that he had contributed in Anupshar and Kurja either. For some reason, I think I missed that sort of. Kurja, he has done. I think this, I read somewhere about the Anupshar thing, but I'm not wholly sure. But um, Kurja is there in this book. There's a mosque that he actually builds over there. Um, and uh, there's the Kurja shops. There's a market street in Kurja. Um, so I think like uh, there is that portion. Now we obviously have to go there. And yeah, yeah, yeah. So. so what I find is that Bulansher, Jahangirabad, and Kurja is it's always been sort of a collective hmm. space and you know, the, the district collectors always had that under their uh, jurisdiction. And um, yes, then I plan to visit. I went up to Lanupshad, but I, I didn't see any sort of specific buildings there and I didn't read about it. But yeah, uh, yeah Kurja, I know there's a bunch of sort of buildings and uh, there, Kurja was also- there's a, there's a uh, Lalaji's house there also, I think, that he builds. Rais, as he used to call them, Rais. Yeah. And I think he, uh, there was a lot of contribution to building bridges as well, which mm -hmm. Jigna will uh, also talk about, because there are these iconic sort of buildings, uh, bridge structures in Bulinshire. Mm -hmm. And Grouse did help build uh, maybe a couple of them. At least he got people to contribute to building those. Yeah. Uh, so the one at Kali Nadi is yeah, one bridge. Yeah. So, all right. No, I think that's it. I just wanted to comment on the Kurja because yeah. I had no idea. And thank you for that. Yeah, I think the bridges were a, a kind of a part of the larger system. And I think that's uh, what happened in Bulanshir. What's there in Bulanshir is an interesting part of that larger system of uh, Ganga Yamuna Canal. That, that I think requires its own infrastructural and engineering research. Yeah, in terms Proben, of Proben Kotli and yeah. all of that, yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, Sat yeah. Satvika, is there any question in the uh, uh, chat? Yeah. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> uh, we do have one question here. So the question is that is emphasizing a deliberate and a conscious way to bring the details in perspective for the observers from different dimensions of social structures. Who could have missed them otherwise? Hmm. Well, um... I think, firstly, um, the understanding that you know that Grouse is producing is that he's reacting against a very establishment discourse, which is basically uh, completely uh, trying to remove any sense of identity from space, which in some context is a good thing, because sometimes when you remove identities, then you have some version of equality. 
right? But the problem is that uh, uh, that is also then uh, becoming the dominant aesthetic. So you actually have the landed gentry. So he actually distinguishes between the patronage of the landed gentry and um, the trader classes. And he says that the landed gentry um, in Bulansher are all imitating, a lot of them are imitating the PWD aesthetic, which is really not an aesthetic as much as it is a removal of all aesthetics. And uh, the trader community, on the other hand, seem to uh, work more with the craftsmen. So essentially, he's uh, trying to suggest that even if this PWD aesthetic or lack thereof is an attempt to do away with hierarchy, it's certainly being taken up by the more powerful moneyed classes within uh, Bulansher. So therefore he feels that there is a power hierarchy that is again created, right? So that's one part of it. So in, in that sense, if through his building, if he's trying to reintroduce nodes and uh, you know, a situational focus or focus for Sai or whatever you want to call it, he is, I think, very consciously trying to create a town where people know each other by name, where this sense of deracination or this absence of any sense of identity is not um, there. And of course, through this entire effort, he's also trying to bring himself into the picture. So, you know, it's, it's really, a, it's a cry for attention. It's not just that he's making these buildings to draw attention to people who live inside them, that is there, but it's also his attempt at bringing attention to himself. So he's increasingly feeling that his efforts are not recognized. And this is the feeling that he continues to have uh, following Manpuri, you know, um, even in Mathura, like, I mean, you see some hints of this. And then by Bulansher, I think it just becomes a full blown kind of expression. Then by the time it's, uh, Fez, um, you know, when he goes to his um, Fatsipuri, where he goes in the final stage, it's, I do, you don't see any images. You know, you just see that like this memoir, which comes out, which doesn't seem to have as much information in terms of his patronage, but still, He's, he's having a huge crisis himself in his personal life. And I think his plea for bringing identity into space is drawing from that internal battle. That he's also so that's my impression. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Madhapati. I think it also brings on to this uh, uh, question that uh, Jonathan was bringing up about the complex, um, his complex narratives of shared histories. I think what, uh, uh, the, the documentation of uh, the legacies that we have so far has been uh, a little simplistic in terms of what it means for, uh, for India or what it means for, uh, for the UK. And I think these, uh, well, I think what you're, what you're bringing out are these kind of complex realities that, that actually existed where the person is, uh, while he can be considered as somebody who was benevolent and tried to create relationships, by, but at the same time using the same tropes of uh, creating an avenue outside the city and creating these markers and landmarks, and in that form trying to bring an attention to himself. And very interestingly, the conflict between that he was having with the PWD, which was establishment of the time. So I think it's a very, very, very interesting uh, position of uh, Mbulanshir sits from that point of view uh, in a very interesting place to bring out many of these, uh, these complex realities of uh, uh, shared heritage and colonial, colonial legacies that we have. Um, is there any other question there, Satvika, that we can? No, ma'am, I think that's that. Okay. Um, I think if there's any last words that anybody wants to uh, speak, Jonathan, Jatinder, Renika, Please, please go ahead. Um, then we'll bring this to close. I think I just wanted to add to what Venu was saying. I also feel that his, you know, him as a person and the complexity of him, I think he was also his sense of belonging to India increasingly as he aged and as he moved. The fact that, you know, uh, he got into religious texts, declared himself a Hindu, went, uh, you know, and, and was a practicing Hindu at the time of his death. Um, his need to identify with, with the, the base narrative of India, you know, was also uh, complex. It was also not just the, 
it was not just anti PWD, it was also, I guess, his artistic or aesthetic or his uh, side that was sort of caught in this, uh, you know, in, in this colonizer space where he felt that he should have been, he should be able to freely share and freely contribute. I think it was anti structure as well in many ways. And that's what my sense of him was, interestingly. Mm. But that's what I just wanted to contribute. <laughs> Um, no, and I, I just wanted to add, I think uh, it's, it's interesting because, um, you know, um, there's also a lot of contemporary associations that people have. So I was interviewing people whenever I was going and uh, some of the mosques that you see in Bulanshahar, I mean, there's a long history of association with those spaces as well. And um, you do see in Grau's, you know, like uh, this is his involvement in this landscape. And at the same time, those structures and those spaces, the square that you show, um, and you're saying that it's changed. I spent, I have like, I've spent, that's where I spent most of my time uh, in Bulanshair, which is next to the, you know, the Bulati house and that central square with that temple turret. And there's a mosque behind. And um, so I spent a lot of time in that mosque interviewing uh, the people around. And there's all sorts of associations that have grown with those spaces. So I think this is the challenge. I think if you, when you're talking about conserving a space, of course, this far away past when things happened, there is no living memory oftentimes of that in those communities. So restoring it from the perspective of an abstract historical sense, sometimes doesn't fully agree with a community memory. Right? This is the conflict between memory and history. So I think that's, that's also you know, something which will unfold right? as we sort of begin to speak to the people you know, who live in those spaces. And you'll realize like right next to that mosque, there are people who've stayed there for quite a few generations. So they have a collective memory of their association with that mosque. Grouse doesn't feature in it. But that's not to yeah. say that Grouse isn't a part of that history, but he's not a part of that memory. So I think like, uh, so the time I was spending there, I was actually speaking to a lot of people and I realized that this is all these ways in which, you know, the past ricochets away into all sorts of directions. Simple point is, uh, conserving will involve also, you know, bringing people from a variety of walks of life on board. And that's why I think like, uh, you know, having some kind of an open conversation, conversations around structures in situ, might actually, you know, get people to actually engage. Um, so that's that's just a suggestion, so that it actually begins to resonate with people's memories, you know. And uh, I think the way you're approaching it, you also got these memories that you uh, associate with the space. I think those are important too. It's not just the history, and I think it's uh, the memories also which become uh, the material for uh, conservation. So that's I think the previous generation Venu remembers, right? Like yeah. in my conversation, and I'm personal as my mother remembers that those areas is active differently because they're all born in 48 or 47 and things had not changed so alarmingly at the time. So yeah, we are doing the collection of those memories as well. You know, in the citizen forum, we're also doing the collection of memories because Great. Then there's association with the buildings and what, what happened in those buildings in the various, uh, uh, in the generational aspect. Mm. I think that becomes fundamentally important. But I think we should uh, close this now because we right, hit just, one and a half hours. I'm sorry. Yeah. Just before you do, can I just ask, do you have any more information on the, the forerunner of Kraus, uh, Raja Lakmansek? Uh, other than the fact that he was a deputy collector. But he got the entire he, book. There is the entire book. I see. That he gazetted, the gazette, the gazette here, it exists. Oh. And I can share that with you. Yeah, that'd be very useful. Because it seems to me, you know, what was really interesting about, you know, yes, amongst many yes. things <laughs> on this session, <laughs> was that this gives us another sense of the word um, decolonization or anti-colonial, that it's kind of it's it's full of complexities, as you've uh, you've said also clearly 
uh, when talking about Krauss itself, but the fact that there were people involved in the similar kind of activity from both sides. Yes, that's true. That's the reason why there were two conversations actually. Grouse, Grouse was leaning a lot on Lachman's documentation uh, on what he eventually did in Valencia. And, and Lachman got caught in, the, in that documentation uh, because the other deputy collector fell out and it landed on his head. Until then, prior to that, it was all uh, oral history. So, you know, I could only imagine the extent of that documentation mm. for, you know, the collection of what he must have done uh, to actually arrive at that documentation. Yes, so, yeah, you're absolutely right to actually bring him back on board because um, I think that's very important. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Jonathan, any, any last words? Just thank you for a great, great discussion. Actually, I think the sense of contemporary and the sense of the sense of history and the sense of the layers that form all of those key aspects between that have been really fascinating to listen to. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. If we can just take one question because it's from Parul. Uh, so she wanted to ask that the who worked in the government the 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 Lachaman, and there isn't much available about him apart from the book that he wrote. Did he also play a pivotal role like Grouse? So uh, I'll take that question. Lachman uh, was actually, he got property and he was given the title of Raja Lachman and I can share some details on him. Um, he does have some connection with Travancore and he was painted by Raja Ravi Varma. Uh, the, the portrait that I have is actually painted by Ravi Varma. Um, I will take that offline with you, Parul, at some point, and I will give you those details, how much ever. But he finally, in his last years, died in Bulanshir. He adopted Bulanshir and he stayed on there. Uh, I don't quite know the house he occupied or where he passed away but uh, he stayed on in Bulanshir. So through Grouse's period, Lachman was there. Unless he was posted out somewhere because he continued his bureaucratic career. I think this, uh, so this brings in very these interesting relationships like this uh, in Bulanshir, this bits between Lachman and Grouse and in Ahmedabad, we have Alexander Forbes and Kavi Dalpatram and that's more of a cultural relationship. But that's also a very interesting relationship where there is somebody who is a poet who writes in Gujarati and he and Alexander Forbes were considered to be very good friends and they kind of uh, uh, took off uh, the clues from each other in their writing. Of course, there are a lot of for discussions about that it was not necessarily an equal relationship, but nevertheless, it's a very talked about relationship. So I think that itself is a very fascinating subject of how uh, these relationships developed uh, between somebody who was from here and somebody who came uh, and then possibly became as became of the place as the time. So yeah, I think uh, I'll, uh, I'll conclude there. Thank you very much for uh, bearing with us through the uh, glitch and uh, we've overshot by uh, I think well, at least 20 minutes, but Thank you very, very much for this fantastic discussion. I'm sure students have gained a lot from this discussion and please uh, uh, don't mind if they get in touch with you at some point to have detailed discussion on the work that they're doing. And we look forward to having you, uh, having a next discussion when the students have done a little more work and getting your feedback on that. Thank you. Actually, the last thing I want to add to this is this was supposed to be a physical session on yeah. the ground at yeah. and share. If Omicron hadn't happened, we would have been all in Bulanshire, yeah. you know, in a winter sun, uh, taking a heritage walk and looking at the grouse buildings. And I think this is where we are gearing up to go. So in the next few months, uh, you know, uh, situations permitting, um, you know, we would like to actually make this a real time event on the ground. And I think and, that's uh, that what uh, uh, Dr. Madhapati was talking about, that these processes have to happen on ground for to understand the reality of the place. It yes, was planned, yes. but I, let's hope we'll take it up. Uh, yes. <laughs>
Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you, you so much, everybody. Take thank care. You. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.